Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Art Talks held by the Institute for Australian Chinese Arts and Culture at Western Sydney University. I'm Professor Jing Han, the Director of the Institute. Before we start, I would like to acknowledge that we are on the land of the Daruga people, who are the traditional owners of the land and pay our respect to the First Nations elders, past, present and emerging. Happy Chinese New Year, the Year of the Dragon. We launched the RAC Art Talks last year and the series has been a great success, covering a diverse range of topics by a group of outstanding experts, including artists, uh, art critics, art historians and curators. If you missed any of the previous lectures, you can still watch the recordings on our website. Today, we are very excited and privileged to have Dr. Jeff Raby, AO, to talk about his incredible collection of contemporary Chinese art over 40 years, with more than 75 artists represented in the collection. In 2019, Dr. Raby donated his collection of 180 works to his university, which is sadly not the Western Sydney University, but the Latrobe University. It was the single largest cultural gift made to the Latrobe University in its entire history. And thanks to Dr. Raby's generosity, we as a general public can have an opportunity to see these works. The Jeff Raby Collection in Our Time is currently on show at the National Art School in Sydney. If you haven't seen it, you must not miss it. Dr. Raby has entitled his talk, The Accidental Collector, which I've translated into Chinese as Wai Da Zheng Zhao De Shou Tang Jia, or even Bu Wu Zheng Ye De Shou Tang Jia because Dr. Raby, as we know by his proper job and public record, is a highly accomplished economist, an outstanding diplomat with a strain of distinguished postings. He was Australia's ambassador to the World Trade Organization in Geneva and Australia's APAC ambassador. He has held several senior positions in DFAT, including deputy secretary, First Assistant Secretary in International Organizations and Legal Division and First Assistant Secretary in Trade and Negotiations Division. And of course, he was Australian's ambassador to China from 2007 to 2011. In recognition of his great contributions to advancing relations between Australia and China and his contribution to multilateral trade diplomacy, Dr. Raby was awarded the Order of Australia in 2019. And among many of Dr. Raby's positions and titles, we are very proud of our connection with Dr. Raby. He was the chair of the advisory board of this institute. Dr. Raby's connection with China started early when he was posted to China in 1986 as economic counselor at the Beijing Embassy, uh, Australian Embassy in Beijing. That posting gave him a front row seat on one of the most exciting times in recent Chinese history. Young emerging artists in Beijing were busy creating what, what would become the much lauded contemporary Chinese art movement. So as early as in 1986, Dr. Raby began collecting some of the works of those local artists. His collection presents a unique window on a particular time and a place in Chinese and hence world art history. In this talk, Dr. Raby will discuss how and why he assembled his collection and share stories of a particular works and the artist who created them. At the end of the talk, we will take questions from the audience. So please post your questions in the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. Now, please welcome Dr. Jeff Raby, AO, to give his presentation. Thank you, Professor Hunting. Um, great to, to be uh, doing this, uh, particularly, uh, as you said, I've been the um, uh, 
chair of the advisory committee of the uh, of the institute for a number of years, and I uh, feel very close to uh, Western Sydney. Um, I'm delighted to talk this evening about the collection, not least because, as uh, Professor Hanjing said, we have uh, a show on at the National Arts School at Darlinghurst, and uh, there's a lot of interest has been expressed in the show. So um, one always has to begin at the beginning, and my, my beginning was that I went to Beijing in 1986 uh, under very unusual circumstances. I was uh, uh, posted there as first secretary economic. Uh, I uh, was not from DFAT. I was from the Office of National Assessment, so I was seconded to DFAT. Uh, I um, had no real background in Chinese at all. Uh, I certainly had very little knowledge of art and certainly none of Chinese art. Um, but I was immensely interested in what was happening in China at that time uh, with the very, very early days of Deng Xiaoping's reform and open door policy. Uh, the reason why I found myself most unexpectedly uh, in Beijing was that um, Bob Hawke, who was the prime minister at the time, uh, had really uh, understood uh, from his conversations with China's leaders at the time, Hu Yaobang and Zhao Ziyang, that if China were to do even half of the things the leadership was saying they wanted to do, it would have profound and very positive uh, implications for Australia. And so recognising the huge trade potential, and don't forget, I mean, in those years, Taiwan was a much, much bigger market for us than China was. Uh, as a diplomat, the interest in China was really a boutique interest. Uh, and once someone went on posting to China, uh, Canberra basically forgot about them for the next two years. And in those days, because Beijing was such a hardship posting, um, uh, all posts, including ambassador, were only two years. So Bob Hawke sent Ross Gano, his principal economic advisor, uh, when a vacancy occurred for the ambassador's job in Beijing, Ross went up to really um, kickstart the economic and commercial relationship between Australia and China, which was uh, Bob Hawke's ambition. And uh, when he arrived in the embassy, he realised that uh, that uh, uh, there was very little capacity, no capacity really, to properly analyse and understand what was happening in the Chinese economy and how it would impact on Australia. And I, at that time, had been uh, in the Office of National Assessments for less than two years as a China economic analyst. Again, I got that job out of academia um, uh, because Hawke wanted more input into what was happening uh, in the Chinese economy and the, the reforms. So one day I received a letter at the end of 1985 from the ambassador, Ross Garner, whom I did not know, uh, only by reputation, asking if I'd come to Beijing and spend a year uh, as an economist in the embassy, seconded to foreign affairs, and to um, and to help build an economic reporting capacity. As it often is, and my career has been largely one of serendipity, I went for one year, one year became two. Foreign affairs and the trade ministry, Department of Trade, were amalgamated at the end of '87. And I found myself, for various reasons, spending five years in Beijing at a time when two years was the maximum posting for anybody. So all of that was quite extraordinary. And so I lived in Beijing from those for the, during those remarkable years from 86 to 91. I was there during Tiananmen Square. Um, I was closely involved in monitoring and watching all of that. Um, and it was a remarkable time. And one of the things I did during that period was to build relationships with artists. Uh, as I said, I, I wasn't um, in any way an art specialist or knowledgeable about art, but I had an interest uh, going back to my days growing up in Melbourne when I would wander along to the N uh, NGV, National Gallery of Victoria, and look at art, read a bit about it, but very much uh, it was all uh, super amateurish. Um, and then I landed in Beijing and I... I suddenly uh, started to meet uh, uh, Chinese contemporary artists who were just starting. And I knew enough about the history of art to make a connection between what I was witnessing on the ground in Beijing in this incredibly exciting atmosphere 
uh, with what I'd read about, say, in the 1890s in Paris, when the Impressionist school was just beginning. Because like then, so it was in the, that time in Beijing, the artists were not allowed to exhibit uh, in any institution. They had no institutional affiliations. The uh, government was starting to struggle with how to understand the contemporary Chinese art movement, but it was all very much part of those years and that moment of great optimism, huge amount of naivety, uh, hope, uh, and and change that people really had not expected, and suddenly it was upon them. And so the 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 liberalising uh, opening of the art scene very much paralleled what was happening with the economy and even the politics. Uh, in China at that time. And I was just so extraordinarily lucky to be on the ground in the middle of that. Uh, soon after I arrived, uh, a very important person in this whole story, uh, Professor Nicholas Jose, who's very much connected with the Institute here at Western Sydney, he uh, arrived as uh, the uh, uh, cultural counsellor. Uh, he was an established novelist by that stage. And he rapidly built remarkable links with uh, the Chinese contemporary art scene. And through him, I met many artists. And through him, many artists came to Australia in the 1980s who feature in my collection. Guan Wei will be well known to everybody. He's very famous, of course. Uh, Lin Chunyan, ASEAN, who is a very, very big name. Um, I was introduced to all of these people through Nick Joes, and he introduced them to Australia and brought them to Australia. And this has become a very strong connection between the two countries that going back to the 80s, we have a long um, tradition uh, of uh, Chinese contemporary artists coming to Australia, developing their careers, returning back to Beijing, or well, it has been in the past mainly Beijing, but elsewhere as well, and, and going on into their careers. So that's why I've titled my, um, my uh, talk, An Accidental Collector, I did not set about building or collecting an artwork. To me, it all comes from my uh, personal associations, friendships. Uh, it's always just been part of my life in Beijing. And luckily, when I finished as ambassador in the at the end of 2011, I decided to continue living in Beijing, uh, uh, build a business in Beijing, and so I lived in Beijing continuously for 15 years from 2007. And during that time, I continued to build the collection. Now, initially, I didn't have much money. Um, it was um, uh, something for me to buy an original work of art. I'd never bought an original work of art ever. Couldn't even contemplate it until I bought my first piece in Beijing. And the works were very, very cheap. The artists were extremely poor. As I said, they had no institutional outlet. There was no market anywhere, neither in China or outside of China, for Chinese contemporary art. The, the small group of diplomats that lived in Beijing in those days and a small sprinkling of business people basically was the sum total of the Chinese contemporary art scene until we get into like the mid-90s. It's, it's that late before before the market develops and the galleries start to get involved. And um, so it was all very much uh, uh, meeting artists, getting to know them, going to, when I say studios, like Lin Chun Yen, who we'll look at in a minute, I went to his hutong in Shidan, but none of it exists any longer. And basically it was a bedroom with a bed, that a double bed that took up nearly most of the... Um, the room, um, a sort of kitchen off the end of it. And somehow it was also his studio with canvases and paint and and, and brushes. Uh, of course, in those days, no one had a, a toilet or a bathroom inside their hutong homes. I wrote once in the Australian Financial Review many years ago that in those days, uh, uh, and, 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 and there, were, there, were, there were no lights. You you found the hutongs by the smell, not by the light. Um, if, if you found the toilet by the smell, not by the um, not by the lights. So those were extremely poor circumstances. And in the piece by Lin Chen Yen, which I'll show shortly, 
and you can see it at the NAS uh, exhibition, you can see the materials are so poor. It took 10 years for that painting to dry because the, the, the paint was so cheap and badly mixed. And the canvas is like a, a Hessian bag rather than a painter's canvas. So it all begins there. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just extremely, extremely privileged uh, to think that I've been able to live this through all the main phases uh, and live it personally. Um, so the collection is is random. It's haphazard. And for a long time, I thought it had no coherence whatsoever. And then maybe about five or even longer now, I guess six or seven years ago, um, a American curator, a friend of Huang Rei, who's one of the founders, the very first founders of the um, Chinese contemporary art movement, had heard about my collection. She asked if she could come and have a look. She came. Uh, I just let her wander around by herself. And maybe half an hour later, and I was starting to get worried what had happened to her. She came back with this huge smile on her face. And she said, this is so hilarious. The collection just reflects your personality. And it was that first time I realized that there was a coherence to what I regarded was just a random collection of pieces. And uh, at that point, I uh, started to think that I would like someone to curate the collection because it was very big by then and make sense of it for me. I must say, most of it was not documented. as It was entirely haphazard, entirely haphazard as you'd expect, from an accidental collector. And... Uh, uh, I eventually engaged Damien Smith, an independent freelance curator from Melbourne, and we just hit it off. Um, I did no due diligence on David, uh, Damien. We had a coffee at the European in uh, Spring Street in, in Melbourne, and within 20 minutes I had engaged him, took him to Beijing. He lived in my studio at the time. I had a studio and, and an apartment, and he basically tracked down every artist in the work. He documented every painting in the work, measured every painting, a highly professional job, and produced the catalogue. And the catalogue now is on sale by Black Ink. Uh, originally, I published it privately. And uh, that tells the whole story with some amazing essays, including, and I'm very proud of the fact, including one essay by uh, Nick Jose who, as I say, I really regard as the the single most important person in in bringing Chinese contemporary art to the attention of Australians and in building that relationship like at the cultural level between uh, China and Australia. Um, later on, I like in the 90s, I, um, I lived in Europe a fair bit. I was doing trade negotiations. Uh, Professor Han Jing mentioned that I was Australia's ambassador at WTO, and I sort of drifted away from China. And you'll see that the collection is a bit thin for the 90s. And uh, then in the early 2000s, I met Ray Hughes, a famous gallerist in uh, Surrey Hills, and Ray had discovered Chinese contemporary art at about that time. And he saw, I guess, what I saw, and we were just so incredibly like-minded about this, and he was bringing artists to Australia, having shows and having a huge um, uh, impact on uh, the knowledge of Australian uh, art buying community uh, about what was happening with the Chinese contemporary art scene. In many ways, he got me really back into it again. And a number of the pieces you'll see uh, are pieces that, um, that I bought from Ray uh, directly here in Sydney, not, not in China. Uh, and there's some nice stories about all of that. Sadly, Ray passed away in 2017, um, much too early, really much too early. Um, but he also, along with Nick Joes, have, I think, uh, a very special place in this incredible story of Australia's awareness and engagement with Chinese contemporary art. So, Han Jing, maybe I might turn to some works with that introduction. So... As, as I mentioned, um, this is uh, Lin Chun Yen. This is the piece I mentioned that took 10 years to dry. You can see in the top left-hand corner near the shoulder a, 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 a mark on the painting. That's where the paint was sticky. And as this painting was wrapped up and moved between my various residents and unpacked, 
uh, it got damaged uh, like that in the process. But I really insist that we see this because uh, this and a couple of works by As ASEAN and so on, uh, with that, you will see just where the, the, the origins of the Chinese contemporary art movement were and, um, uh, and, 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 and how poor and how difficult the circumstances were that these artists started in. Uh, and all are still painting today, which is fantastic to be able to say. Uh, nothing much more to say about this other than uh, I like it because uh, one half of it uh, is um, one, one half of it uh, is, is is realistic. It shows um, the artist's capacity uh, as a painter, technical skill, and all of that. The other part is abstract, and most of Lin Junyu's work since then has been on the abstract side, not on the figurative side. Uh, we have the next one, please. So this really uh, goes back a very long way. This is a, a large carpet made in 1942. And the important thing to understand about the Chinese contemporary art movement is that the artists were very well trained and trained in traditional schools in China. Um, but most of them grew up uh, in a period of, uh, of, of political activity, the Cultural Revolution, propaganda was dominant. And so the, the, the genesis of much of the Chinese contemporary art movement actually lies in propaganda. And it shapes the, the artist's thinking. Um, and a lot of them make fun of it in the 90s when the cynical realism period starts. They, they send all of this type of thing up. But this is uh, a work which is very, very rare. Uh, this, this carpet is very, very rare. There'd only be one on, on the planet. Uh, it's a large carpet made in Hotan in Xinjiang, which is a historically famous and well-established uh, Xinjiang carpet-making area. Uh, and when I bought it, or when I found it, I found it in the back of a carpet shop in Kashgar. I, I knew the carpet seller quite well. Uh, Akbar, unfortunately, uh, he's, he's passed on now. Um, and I just took some friends. I wasn't buying carpet myself. I took friends to the shop. They were looking at carpets. Uh, he was chatting to them. And I was wandering around. I just walked into his office and I found this hanging at the, on the back wall of a very dark office. And I was staggered. And I said to him, got him, I said, Ak Akbar, what's this? He said, it's uh, Guomingdang, KMT, KMT uh, the nationalist. I said, no, it's Soviet. And he said, no, look at the date. It's 1942. It's a KMT. I said, no, it's Soviet. Anyway, after a bit of haggling, of course, I bought the carpet, took it back to Beijing, was uh, reading a bit about that period in Xinjiang, and I discovered why a Soviet carpet was made in 1942 in Hotan in Xinjiang. And that's because the warlord at the time uh, had thrown his lot in with Stalin and had ratted on the KMT. And so that's why we have a Soviet propaganda art uh, piece from that period. Shall we move on, please? Uh, funny story about these. This, this, these are three of us, seven in the series. They're, um, they're, 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 uh, they're, they're galley proofs, if you like, for cartoon propaganda, propaganda to cartoon books. And um, they, um, they, uh, these books were distributed widely, and they're used for different campaigns. Uh, this guy's being attacked for being a rightist which when you look at the date 1977 is a bit late in the Cultural Revolution. Uh, but anyway, uh, I found seven of these uh, pieces in the uh, Panjian Yuan dirt market in Beijing and uh, couldn't believe what I'd found. I asked the lady sitting there uh, how much. She said, oh, 100 yuan. And I said, it's outrageous. Outrageous. So I think for 81, I walked away with seven of these extraordinary pieces. I actually have in my uh, effects in Beijing, which are in storage, one of these cartoon books. It's not the exact figures, or it's not exactly these pictures, uh, but the, the the character is very similar. Uh, and I must you know, pass on that, that comic book uh, to the collection at some point because to see these and to see the comic book understand uh, this this uh, uh, exercise of propaganda. 
Next one, please. Yeah, now this is very interesting. So this is 2009, right? It's it's, it's way out of that period. But it's it's what I was saying. It, the, the influence of propaganda art and so on was taken up from the late 90s into the 2000s during this period called uh, cynical realism. And there's a great story with this because this was, I bought this at uh, a Ray Hughes um, exhibition. Uh, this is a print. The original was in the exhibition and the exhibition was in 2003. These prints were done much later. The original is a oil on canvas, a very, very big piece and incredibly expensive. Chi Ji Lung had a stellar period uh, in the early to mid uh, 2000s. But I took uh, Ambassador Fu Ying. Some of you may remember Fu Ying. She was very glamorous, very uh, urbane, cosmopolitan Chinese ambassador. It was She was always presented as the, 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 the new face of China. And she fitted the age and the moment very, very well. And so uh, uh, I took her along to this exhibition at Ray Hughes called Dim Sum in 2005, I think it was. And there was some really, really outrageous art. And I thought, well, this will see uh, how how um, uh, genuinely cosmopolitan and international Fu Ying was. So she came, we showed around the exhibition on a Saturday afternoon in Surrey Hills in Sydney. And at the end, I said, well, out of all these pieces, which ones do you like the most? And she said, this one that we're looking at now. And I thought, well, hello. I mean, this is the least confrontational, the least challenging after everything else uh, that was in the exhibition. She chooses, if you like, the most um, um, the most comfortable pieces, one way of describing it, I think. And I thought, well, hello, I've, 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 I've caught her out now. I said, here that she's not that cosmopolitan after all. And I said, well, why do you like this piece? And the rest of the story is quite amazing. She said, well, that's me. She said, that's what I was like. She said, we were all like that. She said, it captures the naivety and the optimism about the Cultural Revolution. And she spoke at length about how someone like her, who was in, in like this young woman, was totally involved in the Cultural Revolution. She even said at the end, she said, you know, I'm so glad it ended because I don't know what I would have done. But she said, this captures that moment better than anything else. And there's another piece in the collection by the Law Brothers, who uh, were also very hot during the cynical realism period of Chinese contemporary art. And she turned without any prompting from me and looked at, that pointed at the, at the Law Brothers piece. And she said, this is about the same, same, same time. It's, it's, it's on the same subject. She said, but I don't like this at all. She said, that's how foreigners view the Cultural Revolution. That's how they see it. But she said, this is how we see it. And so in that moment, looking at these works of art, I learned an enormous about, uh, amount just in that moment about uh, that period, the Cultural Revolution, and what it meant to people who were living through it at the time. Uh, terrible period. Everyone acknowledges that and admits it. Uh, but we make a mistake, I think, if we... Don't try and uh, uh, understand from uh, another perspective uh, quite what it was like to be uh, young and alive uh, and engaged and optimistic and hopeful about the future of China at that time. Uh, move on, please. This is Gu Jian, a uh, very good friend of mine. Uh, Gu Jian was arrested in 2014. He's an Australian citizen. Uh, was arrested in 2014 for a piece he did uh, to commemorate the 25th anniversary of Tiananmen Square. Uh, he did a diorama of Tiananmen Square, big one. There were tanks crashing into the Monument of the Martyrs and so on, bound to get him into trouble. Um, but um, uh, he, he went further and he covered the diorama in 30 kilos of minced pork uh, and in June, in the hot Beijing summer, in his studio with a tin roof, he let the um, he let the pork um, rot and smell. And then he invited uh, a journalist from the Financial Times to come in and interview him over this. And it was a very big feature in the weekend section of the Financial Times. And 
the day it was published, he was arrested and kicked out of the country. He's now been living in Australia ever since then. This painting uh, is very important to him uh, in monochrome, as you can see. But the soldiers are both Chinese and Vietnamese. And Guo Jian was a propaganda artist in the PLA. Uh, at the time, uh, China invaded uh, in 1979 Vietnam. And this is about that period and basically showing that the Chinese and, uh, and, and and Vietnamese soldiers have no conflict. They are friendly. They're happy. Uh, they're just one people. Uh, but it's all a, all a theatre cast and crew uh, that's directed by you know, the propaganda authorities. Shall we move on? Yeah, Wong Jiran. Well, Wong Jiran's actually very important in many ways. Uh, he's a very significant significant artist in his own right. Um, these are early pieces by him. Uh, he also was the person who, who, who advised Judith Nielsen of White Rabbit uh, about her collection for the first uh, 15 years or so. Uh, this is just one of, um, it's a series, uh, and it's just, humorous, fun, it's slightly sexy, erotic, but it's 1987, and that's very, very early. Uh, so it's um, quite significant in that respect, and it's also uh, a lot of fun if you see the uh, four, I think it is, in the in the group together. Thanks. Move on, please. Um, yeah, well, this is one of the standout pieces in the whole collection. Uh, uh, Miss Wan studies hard. So there's a lot going on in this photograph. First of all, Chen Men, the photographer, is China's uh, number one most important uh, fashion photographer and has been for a long time. So she's a very, very significant artist. Um, I guess the second thing is uh, that's the sort of obvious is Miss Wan has got a, uh, a Chinese bicycle from the 1980s. And in the 1980s, these were the bicycles we all rode, uh, but you could hardly ever get them. So this is a comment on sort of materialism today, reminding you, though, that in the 80s, China was anything but a materialistic society. And to get a bike like that, you had to be a carter, you had to have certain privileges or being a foreigner, and it would take months uh, to get a bike like that. China was an economy of shortage in those days, not abundance as it is today. She has a pile of books on the back tied up with a Dior uh, ribbon, a Dior bag slung over her shoulder. The figure, Miss Wan, though, is Wan Baobao. And Wan Baobao is a uh, leading jewellery designer in China today. But what is less well known is that her grandfather uh, was Wan Li, Vice Premier Wan Li. And Wan Li was uh, one of the Long March generation of leaders, but he was regarded as very liberal. And during Tiananmen Square, uh, Lee, in the run-up to the 4th of June, um, uh, there was a, a, a view that Wan Li could maybe stabilise the situation and uh, because he was very close to paramount leader Deng Xiaoping, could maybe dissuade uh, Deng Xiaoping from using the military to clear out the square and uh, lead to the outcomes that happened. It was just the case, though. It was just happened to be the case that Wan Li at the time of the build-up to 4th of June was on an official visit to Canada. And uh, everyone, the, the students and so on, were, were hoping Wan Li would come back. They were calling for him to come back and to try and calm the situation down. Uh, Wan Li did come back just before 4th of June, um, but he was his plane landed in Shanghai and he was taken to hospital unwell and spent the next two months uh, in hospital and what happened happened um, afterwards. So there's, there's 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 an incredible amount happening in this in this photograph. And of course it's set in Tiananmen Square. And putting all of that history and context and everything one side, um, it's also an amazing photograph in every respect, technically and so on. So, uh, you know, I'm just delighted to have it in the collection. And it's a big piece. It's it's a big, big piece. Great. 
lots of stories around Gunga. He's a Tibetan artist. Uh, he's very big these days, particularly in sort of New York. Um, the the quick version of Gunga, I'm just checking the time. The quick version of Gunga is that um, he grew up in Lhasa, went in the early 80s to Beijing to study art, studied art at the Academy of Fine Arts, did well, spent quite a bit of time in Beijing, I went back towards the end of the 80s to Lhasa, and for the first time ever, he saw uh, Tibetan Buddhist iconography because most have been locked up or smashed uh, uh, during the Cultural Revolution. And that had a profound impact on him. And as he tried to paint, he had great difficulty because he'd been trained in the classical uh, Chinese techniques of, as I summarize it, uh, bending bamboo, um, rushing streams, soaring mountains, uh, that sort of thing. Um, and his techniques were unsuitable for painting the dry, harsh, arid, massive Tibetan landscape. And so he started painting iconography for a while. He did a lot of quite angry pieces with Buddhas smashed and so on. He then left uh, China and went to Dar es Salaam in India and hung out with the Dalai Lama for quite some time. And then, um, and then uh, still couldn't find his voice, his offer. He just had trouble with his art. And then someone from London, uh, a gallery guy from London, went to see the Dalai Lama, met Gunka, saw his art, and invited him to come to London. Soon after he arrived um, um, in London, uh, he was taken to um, a exhibition of, uh, of Damien Hirst, who was still a, an emerging artist at the time. And then Gunka had this amazing revelation. He just suddenly realized that art could be whatever you wanted it to be. And then he started creating these extraordinary works of, of Buddhas. These Buddhas are made of um, uh, advertising stickers overlaid with uh, uh, with um, gold leaf. And this painting, if it's hanging facing the western set, setting sun, illuminates and it's so gorgeous when uh, when all of the gold is is being reflect is reflecting the sun um yeah it's a it's, it's amazing amazing work thanks we'll try the next one please this is another gorgian so you recall you had the chinese and vietnamese artists um uh in the previous one uh, sorry uh, chinese and vietnamese soldiers in the monochrome previously this is a, um, a a very large piece in heavy, heavy resin uh, of a brain. And um, the brain has, as brains do, is divided in two halves. And the two halves are each covered in erotic couplings. Um, uh, women and men, men and men, women and women. Uh, and each coupling is so beautifully and detailed in its um, representation. And amazingly, this is 2004, and this is just uh, uh, when China was really beginning to prepare for the Olympics, um, and he named it with the uh, name of the Beijing Olympic slogan, uh, One World, One Dream. So it's, it's quite a humorous touch as well. Thanks. Next one, please. This is my favorite of the lot, if I can have a favorite. It also happens to be the most expensive piece I've ever bought. But um, what I pay for it is nothing like what uh, you'd pay if you didn't know the artist as well as I was, knew him as a personal friend. Uh, it's the birth of Venus. It's the take on Botticelli. Um, it's a big oil on canvas. It's beautifully executed. The colors are extraordinary. Um, I just got everything about it that I I, I, I like in art, and uh, and uh, you know the skill is just enormous. It's just breathtaking, um, and it's fun. It's making fun of one of the most iconic works of art in the Western uh, canon. So that's uh, Ling Chen. Um, thanks. Yeah, this is very interesting. Um, this is by Hu Ming. Uh, she's better known 
full, powerful, uh, strong, confronting images of Chinese women in PLA uniforms. And she herself had spent quite a long time in the PLA. This is a bit different, but again, you know, in, in Chinese um, culture, goldfish is about abundance. Gold is rich and, and, and abundance um, and wealth. Um, goldfish is also completely useless. You can't eat it. You can't do anything with it. But here's a comment on a very sexy lady uh, going, basically cuddling up and, and getting close to the wealth and abundance of, of a goldfish. So it again, it's 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 a clear comment on uh, Chinese commercial culture and values. Now these are by uh, Li Jin in traditional Chinese technique, uh, uh, pen and ink, um, rice paper. Uh, this guy is just fantastic. He's super super collectible. Um, uh, but he has a terrific sense of humour. Uh, a lot of this work is collected heavily in Japan and South Korea because the people there like the Taoist influences. Uh, a lot of use of space and, of course, um, uh, a very clever use of, of characters. But they're really gorgeous pieces. And this is... Um, uh, by Rose Wong, uh, she is, or well, she was then, a young, um, a very young uh, Hong Kong artist who came to Beijing to make um, make Beijing a home because she liked the creative environment uh, in Beijing. Um, uh, this is, um, it is what it is, but it's fascinating being done by uh, a young artist. And uh, I've tried to include quite a, a number of works by emerging and young artists in the collection as well. Thanks. Uh, I mentioned Guan Wei before, and all of uh, all of you know, I'm sure uh, Guan Wei. This is from yeah, 1985. I first saw this work in Nick Joseph's house. You remember I mentioned Nick Joseph, the cultural counselor, who played such a important role in the relationship. I would have seen it probably in '87. As I mentioned, you couldn't uh, have, you couldn't have um, uh, these artists couldn't exhibit anywhere in public. So how they exhibit it would be diplomats, including myself, who would um, uh, open up your apartments for a weekend, clear out the furniture, hang their work, and and then invite people to come around. And these were shown by Nick Jones and Nick and Guan Wei are still very very close friends to this day. Uh, and there's four in the collection. Only two are on show at the um, at the uh, the current show at NAS. Uh, but it's I think interesting to see the very early works and um, and the progression in, in, in Guan Wei's work. Thanks. This is also Guan Wei. He started sculpture in about 2008, I think. Uh, I have another piece which is in in the in the NAS show of a white man, one of Guanway's typical figures holding up a cloud. That is the first piece of sculpture he ever did. And I bought it because, well, I didn't intend to buy it. I invited him around for dinner. I didn't know he was doing sculpture. One one night at the residence in the embassy and his wife, Liu Ping, who's sort of the master business um, uh, part of the relationship, walked in with this thing under her arm and said, here, this is from Guanway. This is his first sculpture. And I said, Great, fantastic. Uh, and she said, uh, yes, well, that will cost you $7,500. I said, what? I, you know, I didn't, didn't intend to buy a piece. And uh, she said, it's Guan Wei's first ever sculpture. You must buy it. Uh, so I did buy it, and I'm delighted to have it, and I've added sculpture. In, in fact, the collection has a very big piece of Guan Wei sculpture, a man lying on his back holding a cloud up on his foot. So... Um, yeah, I mean, I think Gormay added sculpture to his range uh, really, really successfully. And I, 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 I love these these uh, figures. They're a bit obscure, uh, floating on clouds. They're humorous. They're happy, uh, uplifting. Uh, 
yet something is 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 not what it should be with them. So it's it's very intriguing. Thanks. Uh, more sculpture, Chairman Ling. Uh, you'll all know Chairman Ling. I don't need to say much. Uh, uh, but in many ways, what's probably not understood that well is that Sydney, this city, played a very important role in in in, in supercharging uh, Chen Wenling's career. A long time ago, he uh, had exhibits at the uh, Sculpture by the Sea, and they were so successful, and they were picked up in the art world internationally, uh, and 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 were very very important and. Really, to demonstrate that, uh, when I opened the show a few weeks ago in Sydney, uh, Chen Wen Ling and his wife made a special trip to Australia uh, just to be here at the opening. So there are a number of uh, Chen Wen Ling uh, pieces in the collection. Thanks. We're done. Yeah, we're done. Thank you so much, Jeff. Oh, uh, I wish we had more time. You know, like uh, just knowing these uh, uh, artworks. So well enough because we have done the translation so but still listening to your story it's just so illuminating it's fascinating and i just want to say as i said many times to you jeff jeff is a, such a, a, a good storyteller and a wonderful writer and always tell jeff write your memoir write your memoir you have so many interesting stories it'd be really really interesting to to hear and also it's a quite fascinating to here, I know now I understand a bit more about you actually, because I've always been amazed by your insights into Chinese society, culture, history, you know, uh, psych. It's just always wondering where and how. I mean, you know, you don't even speak Chinese, you speak some, but not like, you know, some people who speak perfect Chinese, but not necessarily as much as you have that insights. So, as you mentioned, you actually quite get a lot of insights from collecting these artworks and knowing these artists. So, and, you know, get it from reactions like for Madame Puying and her responses to the artwork. It's just quite amazing to, to listen to this. And you mentioned Nick Jose, I just want to mention. Yes, Nick Jose is incredible. We had him doing this annual address while well, Jeff, you were the chair of this institute, uh, the, the advisory board. And the um, his speech is still on our website. It's called Culture Fever, and he did talk about the nineteen eighties and the nineteen uh, early nineteen nineties about the culture fever in China. Wen uh, Huairu. It was an amazing time. And also, Nick is going to give a talk about Australian literature because Jeff mentioned he's a very well established novelist himself so he's going to talk about in search of Australian literature on 21st of February so do uh, tune in to listen to his story uh I just I can see questions coming up but I want to ask take the liberty of our privileged position to ask you a couple of questions um uh, one is um now you know you you talk about being accidental but in many ways not so accidental and also you know someone mentioned that it reflect to your personality of your collection it's quite interesting to see that um looking back because back then you were like at the right time at the right uh, location and also knowing the right people and so all sorts of the right things at the time because these days, contemporary art in China is in enormous. Do you think you would be able to, to do it if it were happen now? Where to start and how to, who to look at it and what to collect? Oh, Hanjing, in really, really different times, really different times. Yeah, it, 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 I'm, not a, I'm not an academic expert and I don't like very much sort of academic making discussion about art too academic but but i would categorize certainly at least three distinct phases of the chinese contemporary art movement the first up to 89 which is when the collection began and when i found my feet if you like and started to understand and, and get involved with and get excited by the stuff as well uh, and i regard that period as very very sort of naive and optimistic and all like the times and the sort of the, the, the first blush of opening 
And we talk about, you know, China's reform and open door policy. It starts with Deng, 79 or thereabouts. But really, even by the time of Tiananmen Square, a decade later, the opening of China and so on was so, so much less than what it was a decade later. So Tiananmen Square happens and it, it, it it's the end of naivety. Uh, it's the end of optimism. Uh, everything changes. There's a couple of years until Deng makes his southern trip in 92. The accelerators pushed on the reforms. The economy roars off. China becomes uh, much more open. But in the art world, that's mirrored and and and, and uh, interpreted uh, as cynical realism. Artists started pushing back against the materialism and consumer-driven growth and consumption and all of that. Um, and and they're really questioning what are the values of Chinese society, right? And then that work, it, it's it's the Fu Ying story, right? What what she likes, um, it really wasn't what the foreigners liked. What the foreigners liked, like the Law Brothers, um, you know, a lot of Chinese didn't like. But it was the Law Brothers, all of these people who did cynical realism, that basically captured the attention of the international art community, and so. When we tip over from the 90s into the 2000s, suddenly everyone's talking Chinese contemporary art. The prices go through the roof. Everyone piles, you know, in China, any artist piles into, into that space because there's so much money to be made. Um, Chinese art prices are stratospheric. World's greatest galleries are setting up in Beijing. It's, it's just another world. And that takes us through the 2000s. And so now you've got an art scene in China which... It's obviously huge. It's not as effervescent. In my view, it's not as exciting or as innovative or challenging as it was in the earlier decades, uh, but it's vast. And, it, it, you know, it's it's a completely different enterprise or, or activity trying to build a collection, if you like, today in China than it was when I started. Having said that, I'm sort of planning soon to go back to China for, for some time, I want to reacquaint myself with the emerging artists because I still think some of that energy is there. I mean, that Rose Wong vagina, you know, that's very exciting work in my mind from a young, very young woman from Hong Kong. And there's a lot of work in my collection of artists when I bought it uh, were quite young. Today, they're less young, but they're still young and emerging. And if you're going to do it, I mean, there is that space to look around. And the other thing I'd say, I mean, institutions like CAFA are still outstanding. They're still producing just amazingly good technical artists uh, who who have great creativity. And so, uh, if you like, the uh, the bones of what's so important about the Chinese contemporary art scene, is technical ability and skill and uh, great creative imagination are still there. Uh, but it is a much bigger, much more commercial. It's a very different world than the 80s. So well responded, Jeff. It's wonderful. Yes, great. I have a, a personal touch on the your collection. Uh, you know, you mentioned many of them were friends and still are friends. So my question is, was it difficult or more difficult to collect uh, works from friends because of the friendship? And did you ever regret buying things from friends? <laughs> great, great question. Very, very incisive. Um, uh, the short answer, or the answer to the, 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 the second question is no, I've never regretted. The only work I've ever regretted buying, and when I say regret, I mean, I don't go home and weep in my handkerchief or anything like that. The only work I regret, uh, on a couple of occasions, I was influenced to buy pieces because my partner at the time said this will increase in value. So I've never bought, ever bought with the intention of resale. It's the same like I collect wine. I never ever think of reselling the wine. It's only there to be drunk one day. Uh, when I can no longer afford to buy that myself, then then it's time to drink it. But but they're the only ones. The only one that any others from friends, I've never regretted it. But it's hard because you're under a lot of pressure. You go out to a French studio, and if they haven't been selling or whatever, suddenly they'll say, Oh, Jeff, you know, we're gonna pay the bills and don't you like this? Or or if if 
um, uh, you know, if, if I, yeah, I mean, if I've had in my uh, apartment works with some other friends, others come around. So where's mine? Why is that hanging there? So there is a lot of, there is actually a lot of pressure, but again, honestly, most of the was bought in a very sort of comfortable, relaxed environment. Often, as I tell the story, after a boozy night out, and the next morning I'd wake up and I'd see a piece of art inside the front door. I think, well, where did that come from? Uh, but that's the fun of it. And for me, it's just been, a, you know, that I, I do it for the fun of it. Yeah, it's a great, great. I love it. Um, uh, Kevin, our uh, colleague, Kevin, friend, uh, has a question. Kevin said, Jeff, thank you uh, for this amazing presentation. What do you see for the future of a contemporary Chinese art? How is it changing with the rapidly changing China? Um, well, I think, Kevin, thanks for being on the on the call and, and great uh, to hear from you. Uh, I think in the period since Xi Jinping has become president, uh, over that period, not initially, but over that period, um, the weight of ideology and propaganda has become heavier and heavier and more pervasive. And uh, frankly, I think the art is less interesting as a result. And some of these artists that you've seen, um, works from works they've done in, say, the mid-2000s, uh, you go to the studio now and you can hardly relate to the work as being by the same artists. So this is the problem always with authoritarian systems, and I don't blame the artists at all, of course not, is that people self-censor. And people don't know where the red lines are, so they're often more conservative than they need to be. Uh, you know, China's being, Beijing's being, that people got things they've done which I'll never show and are hidden away in their homes or their studios. But by and large, compared to a decade ago, um, it's a much more conservative and less exciting uh, art scene uh, than it was, less innovative. And also, because of all that, it doesn't attract the international artists either. A decade ago, when China's art scene was super international, maybe a decade and a half ago, artists from all over the world, they wanted to be there. And, and many Australian artists, people like um, Lawrence Tan, for example, and others, and Brian Wallace set up his most amazing gallery. Uh, people wanted to be part of that. And it's just a very different world today. Mm -hmm. In the same vein, the next question Sally asked is, uh, what do you think the future holds for artists in China? Oh, um, there, there, there will always be a, a market. Uh, my view on all of this really is that China goes through big swings. So the pendulum is in a much more conservative, uh, as I said, you know, heavy propaganda and ideological period at present. Uh, maybe it's still got even further to go. But I think it will come back. Uh, not I think, I know it will come back. There will be another swing in the pendulum back in the other direction to a more liberal uh, phase. Um, a lot of artists are spending more time out of China, and particularly the more established ones who are wealthier and who have you know, homes overseas are spending more time out of China. Uh, I think that's a pity, of course, because it leeches creativity out of the scene in China itself. But you know, there's also, it's fascinating, there's a shift from Beijing to Shanghai. Shanghai is becoming a much more significant um, art centre than it ever was. Contemporary art centre, always talking just about contemporary art, a uh, contemporary art centre that it ever was, and probably is starting to um, uh, put Beijing in the shade. I think it's because Shanghai is actually a bit more liberal. Than, than, than Beijing is, and of course, uh, there's a lot of money in Shanghai. But there will always be um, uh, a vibrant art scene in Beijing, it's, it's, or China generally, um, uh, and that will continue, yeah. Mm -hmm. I believe so too. Uh, the One of the uh, listeners asking, can you remember, Jeff, which Chinese artwork most shocked or surprised you when you first saw it? <laughs> I, I have to confess to being difficult to shock. So <laughs> that would be a great achievement if you shocked me. Um, but which surprised me, uh, it's not, we didn't show it today, but it's in the it's in the show at the National Art School. It's a, a, a pink pig in a spacesuit by Li Da Peng, a Sung Zhuang artist, 
uh, it's on a yellow background, bright pink pig, smiling, grinning, waving in a space suit. And it was done in 2007. And when I went into a restaurant in Sung Duong at that time, I saw this thing hanging. I knew immediately what I was looking at. Here was the guy taking uh, the piss out of the Communist Party's prestige projects. A year or so earlier, they'd sent the first man into the space and the propaganda machinery was in overdrive, you know, singing the praises of the party and the great achievement of putting a man in space. And here is this naughty artist, uh, leader punk, with a happy pig, stupid pig, in a space suit, waving. And I had to hang in my residence, and it was classic, because a bit like the old Soviet Union, uh, Communist Party officials don't really get irony or satire, and this is a complete send-up of the, of the party. And so I was thrilled to see it, so excited and shocked. I really was shocked. Um, I said I couldn't be shocked. Well, yes, I, it, I guess I was with that. So I arranged uh, to go to his studio and I found what I knew I would find. In his studio, he had large canvases of happy pigs uh, waving out, holding picks and shovels, building the Goldman to Lhasa Railway, uh, building the Three Gorges Dam, building uh, supermarkets and shopping malls and so on, all happy, digging away. And it's a great satire and comment on the party and China's you know, uh, rush for development and growth. Yeah. Yeah, I love those paintings. And then in the art show, so people who want to know what the Jeff was talking about to go and see the show, they are yeah. quite a shocking yeah and uh, visually and also it's a quite amazing and a very interesting happy pigs and these pigs are such a cool you know cute uh piglet star star so that satire is actually hilarious but also quite sharp yeah. Rocco has a question yes yeah. um right. Rocco said thank you for a wonderful journey through your art adventure i'm curious that you included in the illustration cartoons uh, you know, that um, uh, uh, playing Mahjong, the content. Yep. So uh, what's this because of their political content or artistic value? Uh, do you think there is less of a lineation between cartoons illustration in China as in the Western world where it's not considered fine art, you know, cartoons? Also, we'll consider digital work soon. Yeah, it's a really good question, and your question, I have to admit, probably goes beyond my expertise. The short answer of why they're included is uh, political, that that I, I just saw it as part of the propaganda uh, antecedents to the later emergence of the contemporary art movement. But there's a really good, I mean, uh, Wong ji cartoon as well. I mean, it's a really good question, and I have to admit, I haven't really thought um about in those terms. As I said, I, I, I'm not so academic about these things, but it, it is something that's well worth talking about. And I'm sure uh, there might be some good research papers in, in, in a subject like that. It, it's interesting because when I see that cartoons, it's actually uh, very different, I'm sure, by Chinese or non-Chinese who see it because at the time in 1977, and when we see that as a propaganda posters, we would think that those people, like, they're very decadent, very indulgent, very bourgeois, and that's very public enemy-ish. But then you're looking now, and I'm looking that now, and I said, wow, how fantastic, you know, they are so cool and so trendy. Yeah. How did yeah. artists know that, you know, people could be this trendy? <laughs> so it's yeah. interesting. So I actually quite love those. And that's very interesting. Well well, one of them that's not shown, we, we haven't shown today, but is in the uh, in the Nash show, is is uh, that same character in the blue jacket and the um, and the um, poker card trousers, um, uh, saying that uh, in the West there's a cartoon of a blue car and it's got a dog running behind it and the driver's drinking alcohol. And uh, he's being attacked for slandering socialism because he's saying in the West, you can have holidays, you can drive a car, you can own a pet, uh, you know, you can have parties. Uh, so it's fascinating that, that that's what the, the propaganda people were focusing on, issues that's like that. Right. Sometimes like unintentionally backfire in a way. So it's actually quite interesting, especially. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, and you wonder now, when I think of it, 
whether the person who did that particular cartoon was actually saying to people, actually, you could do these things in the West. That's right. But but, but concealed the message with a sort of badging of socialism. Exactly, exactly. Uh, and well, we have so many questions. Um, so next question, is there any piece of a work uh, that you didn't buy, which later you regretted not collecting? That was my question too. <laughs> oh dear, there's so many. Yeah. Really, um, I, I, I I can't think of, I, mean, I would have liked to have bought many more of Chen Wen Ling at the time. I, I started buying early. I was introduced to Chen Wen Ling through Brian Wallace at West uh, at Redgate. Okay. Uh, no, there there are many pieces. I must say, quite a number uh, that I first saw at Brian's Redgate Gallery. Um, I wish I had a board, uh, but you know, I, I, when I'm I'm I, I'm not a professional collector, and yeah, um, by the time of the middle of the two thousands, where art was getting expensive. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, Colin McCorris, and you know him well, and uh, he is in the audience, and thank you for a brilliant talk, really enlightening. He has a question. Jeff, you mentioned China, uh, Shanghai as a better for art than Beijing. Are there other cities in that category, for example, Xi'an or Guangzhou? Uh, thanks, Carlos, uh, Colin, and, and thanks for joining us, and good to hear from you. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think... Uh, unlike in the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s, it's now much more distributed. I, I have to say, before Shanghai came on the scene, uh, probably in the 2000s, the, the next one along was uh, Chengdu. Oh. And the Chongqing Academy of Fine Arts, uh, which is actually um, in Chung, Chengdu, but still maintains its old name as the Chongqing uh, uh, so I'm going to be like that, but yeah, yeah, it's still it's in Chengdu, but it maintains its name as the Chongqing Academy of Fine Arts. Um, it um, it uh, I think made a major contribution in training artists, and uh, there's a couple in the collection who actually studied there. And I thought the 2000s, I never really got across there enough to get to know the scene, but there are a lot of very important pieces of artists and work coming out of Chengdu. Today, I think that's still the same. I think Chengdu is still very important. I think probably um, Shanghai still is as significant as Beijing, if not a bit more. But certainly uh, Guangzhou and uh, uh, Shenzhen Shenzhen, uh, have a lot happening, have some great gallery spaces. And again, I think, you know, the old saying about the mountains are high, the emperor's far away, um, uh, applies down there as well. There's just, I think, uh, a slightly more liberal atmosphere, which uh, uh, supports a more innovative and creative art scene. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And sorry, the other things, these places are so immensely wealthy now. Yeah. And 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 you sort of you know if you if if cities are so wealthy and with such a concentration of people, they will invariably have a incredibly you know uh, dynamic and and substantial creative scene, uh, including uh, contemporary art. Absolutely, and Shenzhen in particular fields are with young people, so it's yeah. another thing. It's uh, quite different, and Chengdu is as exciting as in other city for not more it's really um... yeah well our old friend Shen Xiao Min um, uh, is the director of a very significant gallery in Shenzhen and Shen Xiao Min's in my in my show as well one of his pieces Um, but you know you've got people like that who were once quintessentially Beijing artists who are now running significant um, uh, galleries and so on in southern China Mm. Uh, Louisa Guest does just want to say thank you for the wonderful presentation, such an interesting reflection of the changing times. So that's a Louise. So Jeff, we Thanks, could Louise. really go on. And it's so interesting to talk to you. I never had enough of talking to you because you always have so many stories. And as uh, Louisa mentioned, they're enlightening pieces in the columns. So it's quite uh privilege that we have you today so we can't thank you enough so and luckily we have this recording so people who missed it can watch it and people who are here can watch it again so thank you Jeff again for this wonderful talk and for your wonderful generous 
uh, donation of the collection so everyone now can see it and so as I mentioned the people who do not see it have to see it people see it once now after this talk I'm sure like me I want to see them again so go and see it thanks again Jeff and um Everyone, our next uh, art talk will be the long-awaited Tao Ying, the curator of uh, Art Gallery of New South Wales. She will talk about uh, curating art shows of Chinese uh, artists or Chinese Australian artists at New South Wales Art Gallery. So we'll send out the invitation. And thanks again, everyone, and see you next time. Have a good evening. Thanks, Hanjing. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you.